itself is a paradox in nature. The more we want, the less we have. The less we're conscious about, the more likely we find ourselves in a state of happiness. Today, I'm going to unravel the reason why our endeavor for happiness actually works against us and redefine the sense of happiness to establish a sustainable, healthy well-being. To many, these are some of the aspects of life that serve significance. This includes the monthly income, academic achievement, acceptance theory, and family connections. We often believe that these elements in life brings us happiness, offering joy and satisfaction. However, happiness in nature is much more elusive and ambiguous. Professor Fred Feldman in his paper claimed that neither people's contentment nor affection towards life singularly determines the level of happiness. He also stated that the definition of happiness remains theoretically undefined due to people's varying perspectives. Here, what's ironic is that none of us are completely aware of what happiness actually is, but every one of us is striving to achieve it. This is the reason why we find ourselves drifting away from happiness in an attempt to grasp it. However, in scientific perspective, happiness is defined. Scientifically, we define happiness as the pleasure sensation caused by the release of a neurotransmitter called dopamine into the brain system pathway. In some aspects, the dopamine mechanism resembles a busy delivery system. If we encounter a stimulus or a pleasurable event, the brain releases tiny happiness packages into the synaptic cleft. The synaptic cleft is a space between two neurons, like a waiting area. The happiness packages then connects with specific receivers called receptors, spreading the pleasure gifts inside. This release causes the sensation that we call pleasure, or interchangeably, happiness. But the problem arises as we go up. Everything must also come down. Having a high level of dopamine in our brain challenges against our desire to maintain homeostasis, a state of equilibrium. Think of a scale. Placing too much weight on one side causes the balance to tilt. The same weight must be added or taken off to reach towards balance. To do this, the brain enters a step called dopamine deficient state by intentionally lowering the level of dopamine that was heightened during the usage of a stimuli. This is the reason why we feel bored or unsatisfied during the moment without our stimulus, most commonly our phone, since stimulus increases our level of dopamine. It is our brain that's reducing this level of dopamine that's heightened by using this deficient state. Eventually, we grab our phone back and re-expose ourselves to the stimuli, unable to bear the lack of pleasure. This excessive attachment to stimulation and high dopamine state is what we call dopamine addiction, an inescapable loop of pain and pleasure. To clarify, general addiction and dopamine addiction are two different forms of addiction. General addiction encompasses both substance and behavioral dependencies, such as alcohol abuse or gambling. These stimuli are highly compulsive, resulting in explicitly negative consequences. In contrast, dopamine addiction is our attachment to stimulating contents in our daily lives. These stimuli, such as the use of video game or social media, is much more milder and familiar. The consequences thus is also gradual and much subtle. An example of general addiction would be the use of drugs. Metafentamine, for instance, a type of drug increases the dopamine level by over a thousand percent. In contrast, video game usage an example of dopamine addiction stimuli increases the level by less than 200%, which is highly less than that of the drug use. In that sense, excessive usage of electronics is a major form of modern-day dopamine addiction. In fact, internet addiction has become a significant issue nowadays in South Korea. In 2001, 
Over 40% of Korean adolescents were addicted to internet, including my past self. When I was eight, my parents gifted me a new smartphone for entering the school. In retrospect, the new phone was like a novel world for me, a paradise of entertainment. Since then, I became excessively attached and immersed in the online world, finding pleasure and motivations inside the bright screens. In 2022, the average screen time for current adolescents were about 7.1 hours on weekdays and less than 10 hours on weekends. Dopamine addiction is not a theory, but a reality. People, especially adolescents these days, are surrounded by stimuli and electronics that they cannot resist, falling into their search for dopamine. Every case of addiction starts with an access to a stimuli. In fact, the expanding severity of dopamine addiction in the 21st century was an inevitable phenomenon. Directly, it was the result of the advancement of market and media that increased smartphone accessibility. From 2002 to 2022, mobile internet access in South Korea has increased from 67 to 99 percent. Simultaneously, from 2010 to 2022, people addicted to internet in South Korea increased from 8 to 20 percent in total. There is a strong correlation between the prevalence of stimuli and the possibility of addiction. The easier and the more abundant the cues are, the more likely we're going to be addicted. Opium war in China was an instance where increased access to drug or stimuli led to a nationwide scale of addiction. In 1830s, Britain began exporting a large quantity of opium a type of drugs into China. Now what do you think has happened after? At the end of the 19th century, 90 out of 300 million Chinese population was addicted to opium. Indeed, drugs are incomparably more severe level of addiction than that of electronics. Yet in terms of accessibility, electronics are far more abundant the drugs, with over 95% of American adults having access to internet. Moreover, regardless of gender and age, anyone could access smartphones, whereas drugs are legally prohibited in many nations. This easy access is what makes us so susceptible to dopamine addiction. In fact, the spread of immediate pleasures or immediate stimuli can be traced back to the second industrial revolution. During this time, inventions, technological inventions such as radio and phonographs produced new, new forms of entertainment and pleasure. Particularly, the invention of mass-producing prints allowed written records to be spread more easily. In Britain, sensational fictions and escapist entertainment gained widespread popularity. Notably, the woman in white in the East Lynn were among such works experiencing high demands in sales. Similarly, in the United States, the invention of motion picture camera and movie theaters allowed people to access visual entertainment. In the 1920s, over 50 million tickets were sold every week in movie theaters. These inventions made entertainment more accessible and pleasure more immediate, fueling a craving state for stimulating content. As history proves, dopamine addiction has the power to alter and stimulate a large population. It is no wonder why people were so attached to movies, or opium, or fictions, because being on internet was, the constant, was a constant form of pleasure for me too that I wanted to continue on. Based on the definition, I was sure that what I felt was happiness. This habit of mind prolonged into the middle school years, transitioning into daily lives. Sometimes I reached a daily phone time of 10 hours and a weekly average of 13 hours a day. Electronics has become a part of my life. Taking just a minute away from the phone or my electronics plunged me into a sense of boredom and emptiness that I wanted to elude from. 
To some extent, the period without stimulus felt like pain. Conventionally, pain is described as a feeling of physical or mental suffering caused by an injury or illness. However, from a psychological perspective, pain can be also described as a sense of boredom, discomfort, and emptiness that starts from the lack of pleasurable stimulus. Psychologist Anna Lemnick describes this as the pleasure-pain balance. To reach physiologic equilibrium, our brain stimulates the same amount of pain to the amount of pleasure that we bring in. Refer back to the balance. If we add two chunks of pleasure to the left, two chunks, the brain adds two chunks of pain to the right. This balanced state is why we can experience pain and pleasure independently, but always in coexistence. We can never feel only happy nor sad, but rather experience a balance of emotions. Because of this, pain is a crucial element for maintaining homeostasis. However, in our common sense, we perceive pain as a negative sensation, as a noxious sensation that we must elude from and avoid. For me, I ran away from pain by connecting myself with electronics. With my earbuds on, I kept myself stimulated even during the shortest moment, such as walking to school or having a quick meal. This excessive usage of dopamine reward pleasures and stimulus is what we call dopamine reward loop. This is a loop of dopamine rush and deficient state driven by the presence or absence of stimuli. For instance, we pick up our phone. We see something stimulating and we feel satisfied and pleased as a form of reward from dopamine. But after an hour of usage, we don't feel the same amount of stimulation or pleasure as we did before. Eventually, we put down our phone again and try something else. But the same kind of boredom makes us pick up our phone again. The body's pursuit of pain and pleasure is what causes this paradoxical loop. The more we try to run away from pain, the more we suffer from pain itself. To many, this cycle may seem relatable and somehow familiar. In fact, we, sleep, we seem to live just fine while carrying all these loops and addiction. Then what makes this cycle so toxic? The answer lies in its long-term effect. The dopamine reward cycle takes away our ability to feel and see the natural world as we did before. Because our baseline for dopamine is heightened, we can't feel the same amount of motivation or the need to engage in activities that lack enough stimulation or pleasure. As a result, we tend to shift our focus to immediate rather than the long-term pleasures of our life. This is the reason why we fail to reach true happiness nowadays. Happiness is becoming ambiguous because we seek for happiness in the wrong form of sensation. If we take a step back and look at the greater fame, we can identify a trend to happiness. Take a look at these graphs. These are the graphs that depict the happiness rate of people in South Korea, United States, and Japan from 1993 to 2022. In all three graphs, the happiness rate increases dramatically from 1990s and remains relatively constant after entering the 21st century. In fact, the rate seems to decline gradually in the United States and South Korea. Historically, the 1990s was a time of prosperity and advancement. All three nations, especially South Korea and the United States, was experiencing economic growth and advancement. Yet, ironically, the 21st century was far more stimulating and pleasurable. Called the digital era, the rise of technology and entertainment has given access to more immediate pleasures to the people. However, ironically, the graphs from 21st century enter a state of plateau, meaning that people were no longer happy, and in South Korea, in the United States, people are becoming less happy than they were before. Indeed, there are various factors that affect one's determination of happiness. 
However, as the graphs indicates, the increased access to entertaining stimulus or immediate pleasure did not make us more happy. In short, pleasure is not happiness. Now we go back to the question, what is happiness? Can we drive happiness from immediate pleasures? What can we do to make ourselves happy or happier? When I first decided to escape this toxic cycle and loop, the first thing I knew I had to do was to regain control of myself. From being controlled by the excessive stimulus and short-term pleasures, I knew I had to be able to decipher myself the type and duration of the pleasure that I consumed. From my experience, there are several effective ways for us to unchain this toxic cycle. The underlying concept of happiness is establishing a balanced lifestyle. Life is of a balance, whether between pain or pleasure or good or bad. This concept applies to happiness as well, where the coexistence of immediate and short-term pleasure is necessary for us to establish sustained happiness. The faster we realize this, the quicker we can approach the ultimate happiness. So the first step we need to use is to use metacognition to restore our pleasure-pain balance. Once a week, we should take an objective reflection of ourselves in the form of pleasure that we consume. Keep track of your weekly phone time. If we have spent a long time online during the week, try to take a day or week offline the next week. Instead of mindless scrolling, take mindful reflection of ourselves. Many people nowadays seem to underestimate the value of silence time. However, the period provides not only a pause for an excessive stimulus, but also a period of self-discovery and creativity. By looking inward into our thoughts and feelings, we can, get, we can get clear insights into our desires and what truly brings us joy. Second, we should promote an environment consisting of sustainable and long-lasting happiness, especially for parents and children. Every addiction starts with an access to stimulus. However, it is up to the parents to determine whether their children overconsumes it. Because of this, parents should work to cultivate an environment consisting of engaging the long-term pleasures activities for children. This includes exercising or creative pursuits like arts and music that provide a sense of accomplishment and pleasure from endeavor. Normalize family dinners, normalize family walks, or a reading session. Guide our children to appreciate the value of subtle satisfaction that comes from these activities. Third, as a society, we should redefine a sense of happiness and the conception of happiness itself. Society plays a crucial role in this transformation. Educational system, media outlets, and community organizations should work to foster and highlight the benefit of long-term fulfillment for meaningful accomplishments. Instead of highlighting the viral overnight successes and the fleeting trends in media, we should highlight and celebrate the story of sustained effort. Together, we should reframe the conception of happiness, readjusting our goals and behaviors accordingly. Always remember, Life is not a sprint, but a marathon. Happiness is not short and euphoric, but rather long-lasting and fulfilling. So lace up and start your marathon for happiness. Thank you.